Okay, great. Uh, welcome everyone. Good morning. Um, we are, I mean, there's people joining in, so I'm going to slow start this. So while we are slow starting, please feel free to, um, you know, get started on our first poll of the day. Uh, there will be many. Some will be fun. Um, some will be serious, but uh, if you want to just get started on that. And Kat, I'm sharing my screen, right? Oh, no, I'm not. You will, as soon will. as we take down the mentee poll, yeah. yeah. <laughs> just, literally, I was you like, just great. Tell us when, Leal, tell us when. I was when. gonna say, ask Julie. <laughs> All right, um, let me go to the slide deck and then we'll come back to the results. But if meanwhile, everyone wants to, uh, there's two small questions just to get us started. Um, and I'll, I'll refer back to them um, and we can put them back up. So, there we go. Okay, here we are. Uh, welcome again, everyone. Thanks for joining us today on day three. Um, it's my pleasure to uh, kick off um, our strategy sessions, um, which will be the next sort of three, four hours. Um, I'm going to quickly just give you a layout of the day because it's very packed um, and I know many people are coming in and out. So we have an hour right now uh, where we're going to uh, introduce the, the new Alliance strategy uh, and really dive into its goal, its theme around the centrality of children and their protection. Then we have a 10 minute break uh, and then we go into uh, more detailed discussions on the priorities and I'll, I'll share more information with, on that in a little bit. Um, so we have 65 minutes uh, to talk about one set of uh, one set of themes related to the strategic priorities, another 10 minute break, another 65 minutes um, to talk about different discussions, different themes related to the priorities, um, and then we will wrap up. So uh, just before we get started, there's a poll in the chat. Uh, and basically, we're just asking, um, you know, just to start, did you know that, <laughs> that the Alliance was developing a new strategy? Uh, and did you participate in any of uh, the consultations? So um, we actually started this process uh, this time last year during the annual meeting um, in a similar session with me. So some of you will be back <laughs> to, to, to wrap it up today and some of you are joining us for the first time. Uh, if you don't remember if you were there, I know last year um, in COVID time feels like many years ago, uh, here's a little Reminder, so do you see yourself here? Were you with us last year? Um, oh, that's a bit early, but okay. Um, uh, yeah, so were you with us last year when we talked about the strategy and developed things? Um, Julie, can you go to the next one, please? And so here's just trying to get a sense of who's in the room. Um, if you can answer the next question. So some of you participated in the annual meeting, some of you participated in online consultations, some of you would have participated in uh, online surveys, and then, um, and then there's the always uncertain. Um, it's interesting like that. So um, while that's being filled out, um, just to talk through a bit of the process before we get into the strategy itself. So we did begin last year uh, we had discussions on this day around, um, you know, what the membership, what the participants um, thought was important. Um, and I'll show you a couple of slides to refresh memories on what we discussed. Uh, and uh, we came out with a sort of a prioritized list. So you can see there's a lot. So a lot of people new to this, which is great. Um, and from that, so I'm going to just kick back to the slides for a second, Julie. This is, this is us last year. Um, and uh, these are the different topics. This is the, you know, the notes, the journalism notes that we get, uh, that we discussed. We talked a lot about um, familiar themes. I think you'll see some on prevention, some on climate, some on uh, things related to working with communities and local actors, um, child participation. And then we had some in-depth conversations on multi-sectoral uh, and integrated programming, uh, on child participation and what that means to be meaningful. Um, on localization and working better with our community and local and national counterparts. 
on um, capacity building, which we've transitioned to calling capacity strengthening um, and how to improve the quality of that across the sector and with our other sector counterparts. Um, and we talked about um, what we were then calling the centrality of child protection. We were floating around this idea of how do we um, prioritize and highlight the needs of our sector and the, uh, the children, the families and the communities we work with. And then, oops, we've skipped ahead. We did this little vote, which some of you might recognize, and I'm sharing this for one very specific reason. Um, those of you that do research or assessments, you know, we always tell, say good practice is to go back to um, the people you consulted with and share back a bit of the findings and research. So this was how we ended last year. We had identified all these areas that were um, important. We voted on which ones, you know, were being suggested to be taken forward in some way. Uh, and then, and then I'm sure like in many conferences where you talk about a lot of things, it's completely unsure what happens with what you discussed and what you voted on. Um, and so we just wanted to take a minute to, to come back and let you know that uh, we did quite a bit with this information that was taken last year. So this list became the basis of um, all the working group and task forces work plan planning. So they were putting together three year plans. Um, and it was the discussions and conversations started at this meeting last year that fed into that. Um, this list guided every step of the strategy development and um, our discussions on what would be included as a priority, what would be included as objectives, what the alliance was going to focus on and how um, in the next five years. Uh, you know, in any interagency setting, there are disagreements. Um, the alliance is not different. And when, when there were disagreements on what should be really like prioritized and really um, emphasized, uh, we came back to this list and you had some very passionate advocates, um, you know, who, who led these conversations last year, who were trying to bring forward uh, what was shared at the meeting into, into these discussions. And uh, we hope as the day goes on, um, and next I'll start introducing the strategy that you will see uh, your points, the, not just the things that were highlighted as, as important to prioritize, but also um, even just down to the detailed nuance of notes in Jamboards uh, and those who participated in surveys. Uh, we really tried to take your words and, and the issues that you marked as important and integrate them into the strategy. So um, as we spend today unpacking it a little bit and discussing different points, we hope you see that reflected in there. Um, and um, yeah, and we hope you get excited about it. So let us uh, dive into the strategy. Julie, if you can put up the PDF, I think I'm just going to speak to that for a little bit. And I see lots going on in the chat, which is great. So just quick glance. Um, welcome to the overview of the Alliance strategy. Uh, there's a lot in this page. I'm going to talk you through it slowly. And then again, throughout the day today, throughout the sessions, we're just going to, you know, go deeper into different parts. So we have an overarching goal. Um, and this one is around uh, what we came to phrase the centrality of children and their protection. The goal being to recognize and prioritize um, children and their protection as essential and life-saving across the humanitarian system. The entire strategy and everything in it links back into this goal. And I'm sure even now um, you can think of how your actions and your programs and your, you know, the services you provide, um, the, the preventative actions taken within child protection really um, fundamentally all feed into this. And so this is why um, we chose it as, as the umbrella for everything um, that the Alliance works on and that the strategy will seek to do. Um, within that, we have identified four strategic priorities. Again, um, they should be very familiar because this came from, from the suggestions from last year. So the first one um, is accountability to children, which includes ensuring their meaningful uh, and equitable participation. Uh, the second one on localization and uh, transforming how child protection works in humanitarian action. Uh, and we'll have two sessions on this later today and we'll really talk about the language and why this is phrased the way it is and what that means. Um, the third priority on multi-sector and integrated programming and collaboration, which is always identified um, as a priority need and area for child protection. So many of our programs, so many of the protective factors and, and risks and how we address them need to be done in collaboration with other sectors. and um, we you know, needed to emphasize that within the strategy. Uh, and the fourth one, and this is not a surprise if you've been here this week on prevention um, and working on prevention, uh, population level prevention and, and really um, strengthening what we do on that and then also pushing the, the broader humanitarian system on that. So 
um, the strategy, those are the four priorities. In addition, we have um, sort of a looking ahead. So the strategic plan covers five years, 2021 to 2025, um, but also we could not neglect that the climate crisis um, is, is ever present and will continue to be present and influence what we work on. And so on Friday, there is a special day um, to look into the climate crisis um, and that is, uh, and it will link back to the strategy. So today we're going to focus on sort of the, the, the core structure, the priorities, the objectives. Um, and on Friday, the, the climate crisis will be more addressed, um, but there you'll see issues of um, climate justice and climate protection. So a lot of, the, again, uh, really links into how we um, think about child protection and the approaches that we take to working with communities um, and with systems. Um, and then the other thing I wanna highlight quickly is on, um, the core functions of the alliance. If you look at the bottom uh, of this of this page, you'll see the five core functions. Some of which are going to be very familiar to you. Um, the standards, of course, with the CPMS, uh, working on evidence and, and assessment and measurement tools and knowledge generation, working on advocacy, convening. We're all here. This is you know the big meeting for us every year. Um, but uh, for the duration of the strategy, one thing, and again, this came out of last year's annual meeting. Uh, that we've decided to elevate one of the core functions that we'll really be focused on and is, um, you'll see, is, is included in all of the objectives um, across all the priorities is the capacity strengthening learning and development function. Um, so we heard very loud and clear that there is a um, big, uh, big desire from within the membership and across the sector to really strengthen how we our own capacity, our capacity to work with other sectors, other sectors' abilities to work with us, um, to, to share knowledge, to share and transfer knowledge um, across, across populations from communities to us, from local and national actors, um, and between international and national and local actors, a lot of different words uh, used around this. Um, and so you will see, uh, when, you, when you get a chance to look through the strategy, you'll see a common theme of um, capacity strengthening and learning and development throughout it. Um, I was going to hop into all the objectives, but I think actually I'm going to leave that for um, the sessions later on today. But Julie, if you just want to click on the buttons uh, just to show people. So there's objectives, uh, strategic objectives for each priority. Um, later today, those will be explained in a little more detail. So I think I'll, I'll leave some of that for then, but you can see um, a lot of thought. And this is where you will especially start to see some of that L&D come through. And also uh, a lot of the threads of what we received um, in the consultation, starting with the annual meeting, through the surveys, through um, uh, sort of group consultations and interviews. Um, a lot of the substance that was shared with us, uh, you'll start to see fitting within, within, the, uh, within the objectives. Um, so that's the quick, the quick snapshot of the strategy. Um, what we have planned for the rest of this session, um, just to kind of quickly walk you through, we're going to have a conversation right now um, about the centrality of children and their protection and about the centrality of protection. Um, we know there's um, a lot of uh, commonality between these two things and then also some confusion. And so we're going to take an opportunity to really have a good conversation about what they are, how they work together, how they relate, how they complement. Um, and then after that, we'll wrap up this session with, um, I'll come back and basically just explain how the rest of the day is going, how the rest of the session is going. Um, and uh, we will have, like I mentioned, sort of in-depth thematic conversations. I'll just highlight what those are for you um, so that you can pick where you wanna go and how you wanna participate for the rest of, um, for the rest of the sessions related to the strategy. So um, as I just quickly scroll through the chat, um, without further ado, if we want to perhaps switch over to our panel, um, it's my pleasure uh, and honor to be introducing uh, three speakers this morning. Um, and we're just gonna have a interactive Q&A or a bit of a chat um, uh, around again, the centrality of protection and the centrality of children and their protection while we are chatting. Uh, you will also have an opportunity to contribute. I recognize it's very difficult to do a Q&A online with 150 people. Um, it's difficult to do a Q&A online with 150 people uh, in person, I mean. Uh, so while we are having this conversation, we are going to invite you to participate in this conversation. Uh, you will see in um, the chat, there will be a Mentilink shared. And so while we're talking about a question, you'll have the, uh, the opportunity to also answer that question and to share your thoughts. Um, so 
a bit of a split screen, but I think we're all getting better at this. So we will be talking real time and you will also have the chance to input real time uh, via the Menti. Um, and we'd love to hear what you have to think on these important, important areas that affect our work. So um, that's enough from me. We're going to hop into it. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, our panelists, William Schmeli, who is the coordinator of the Global Protection Cluster, Alison Sutton, who's the Global uh, Director of Child Protection with Save the Children, and uh, Tasha Gill, I'm just like looking on my screen because I'm not sure what they are. <laughs> and Tasha Gill, who's a, the Senior Advisor for Child, a Special Advisor for Child Protection and Emergencies with UNICEF. I always get that wrong. I'm so sorry, Tasha. <laughs> um and uh yeah and so you know if we were in a room yay applause and here we are with our panelists thank you um so i think everyone is now spotlighted because i can see you which is always helpful um like i said we're just going to go back and forth have a bit of a conversation for a little while uh, and meanwhile please start looking in the chat um, because our first question which i'm going to direct to william is also the first question for the audience um william could you start us off a little bit? <laughs> no pressure. Could you start us off by explaining the centrality of protection to us a little bit, how you know we fit within that, um, how we work together? <laughs> yeah. uh, thanks so much. Uh, can I say no to your question? I would like to start somewhere else. I mean, you can, else. and I'll just... <laughs> <laughs> but then you're entrusting like... <laughs> me to explain it. <laughs> Listen, before I dive into the centrality of protection, I want to say that I really like the, the vibe of the Alliance, and this is the third time uh, I engage in, uh, in your annual meeting. And I think since it's a strategy launch, I would like to elaborate before going into the substance matter why um, I'm a big fan uh, of the Alliance. Uh, I think first, uh, you are always kind to invite me to your annual meeting. And that's, uh, uh, that's beyond the formality. I think it's a recognition uh, of, of the link between the natural link between general protection work and, uh, and protection work related to uh, to children. But besides, uh, child protection actors are my boss. Uh, in a way, our members uh, in, in, uh, in our operations, in our 32 operations, many of them are child protection uh, responders. In my global strategic advisory group that I report to, uh, of course, Alison sits there, UNICEF sits there, uh, Judith Consult, who is a Congolese a child protection actor, uh, sits there, uh, uh, Street Child sits there. So literally my boss, and I think that's, uh, uh, that's important to recognize uh, in, uh, in this uh, work. The second reason uh, why I come for, for these events and I'm keen to participate is um, it's so obvious. Children are half the population we work for. Uh, and it's an influential half where if children are protected, the other half is better off. And if the other half is protected, the children are better off. So it's, a, uh, it's beyond centrality. Uh, children are dominant by numbers in the humanitarian sector. So they've done their job, they occupy the space. Can we make them central? Can we match the centrality? Uh, uh, they're, they're, the, the sheer quantitative uh, importance, uh, uh, if I don't want to talk about the qualitative importance of, uh, of children in, in the humanitarian settings. And third, I think, which is the most relevant for today, we are in a time of change strategically. The, humanitarian system is ripe for change. Uh, it's boiling. Uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, important spaces where discussions are happening about localization, accountability to affect population. Uh, the cluster system is no longer fit for purpose. Uh, I repeat, it's no longer fit for purpose. It has to evolve like it has always done. And the alliance beyond the substance is a fascinating model. Uh, this group of actors that you came together around the substance, about around an issue in a hybrid way, you're a humanitarian development piece, international, national, activists, calm, diplomats, the wild. This whole uh, model in itself that focuses on an issue uh, I believe it's the closest model to the future of humanitarian action. So before I dive into centrality of protection, I would like on the launch of the strategy 
uh, session say uh, you are you have taken protection of children from a space where you had to fight for space you had to fight for children cause for for decades especially the last decade to a place where it is clear that it is important it's central it's a main issue it's no longer needs sales and i think on the launch of your strategy i invite all of us uh, to 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 accompany that change we no longer have to fight for space for children half of the humanitarian aid at least to be conservative goes for children that's a fact can we sit and put that hat on and instead of fighting for space for child pro children protection guide and lead the whole humanitarian sector and i think the alliance is ready to use the next five years the next few years with this strategy uh, to be bolder to be louder to be more leading and to occupy the, st the space uh, the space it deserves so I invite you to use this momentum and uh, lead the way for all of us and the rest of the protection sector and the wider humanitarian sector. So we start imitating the Alliance and other parts of protection because you're ahead. So stay ahead and don't pretend to be behind. Now, let me turn to to the centrality of protection. I think uh, I will not take time to explain to an audience of experts, policymakers, and practitioners what the centrality of protection is in a, in a boring legalistic way. But what I would rather focus on is to say that in all our humanitarian work, being protection central means uh, that for every action we do, First, we do no harm for people through our action. More importantly, we actually help. And on the longer term, we help build the resilience of people that we're working for. And centrality of protection in practice on the front line boils down to these three simple things, where for every action we do, we are not hurting, we're not increasing the pain, the suffering, the imbalance, the bad dynamics, we are helping someone or a group or a community. And we're definitely building a resilience uh, uh, moving ahead for, for the long term. So when we look at children specifically, we have to look at every humanitarian intervention of how it improves the dynamics of kids. For example, if we look at the food security sector that would go to a village and count if there are enough calories on the tables to eat, I think that's very important for food security. However, for children protection, it's not sufficient to see if children are eating or have enough food on the table. We have to see what's also happening under the table. Do we have enough food on the table because children are working in a horrific condition? Do we have food on the table because kids had to be dropped out of school to be able to put food on the table? Do we have food on the table because a girl was married off at the age of 10 and 11 for a certain price that is allowing food? So when you are doing a food intervention with children at the center and with protection at the center, you have to look at the broader impact of what's happening and design your intervention in a way that doesn't only put food on the table, mm -hmm. but also addresses the preconditions that would allow for that food to be eaten with dignity and with children having their best interest for the future. And this mentality that I'm speaking about is progressing in all humanitarian sectors. And I think what centrality of protection and centrality of children and that pro their protection means to me from where I'm sitting, is that for us first to do our job well in whatever humanitarian sector we're in, do it well, do it properly, understand properly and intervene in a way that doesn't do harm, that helps and that builds resilience. And more importantly, is that we 
stop looking at uh, centrality of children only from a protection perspective, because we need all the other sectors and that we also continue looking at centrality of protection, not only from a children perspective, because we need a whole community. It takes a village to take this onwards. So I congratulate you for, for this focus. I congratulate you for that positioning uh, of children. And I believe uh, uh, we have good momentum uh, to make your strategy a reality. Back to you, Laya. Thank you, William. You've given, <laughs> I'm like many, many follow-up questions to that, but I'm gonna go to Allison then. Uh, from what you're saying, Allison, William was talking about how we need to be bold and to lead um, and actually, took many of the things that we have within the strategy um, working with other sectors on how we look to prevent things um, and brought them up. And that's a little bit why, not a little bit, that is why we have, we are, you know, centering the strategy around the centrality of children and their protection. Um, and it connects to many of the things that William was talking about um, and, and broadly across the system. Could you um, talk to us a little bit about, um, about how this fits, about how, um, you know, how as a sector we can lead on ensuring that children, their protection needs really are not just as William was saying, with, you know, centered to us, I think we're there, um, but, but broadly across the system and its different elements and, and policies and, and practices. Yeah, can you see and hear me? Because I was having some problem getting my mic. Is um, you hearing me? Right. Yes. Great. Okay. No, I, I just, I really want to agree with William about the opportunity and the responsibility of the Alliance to be such a strong space for this discussion and, and an actor driving it forward. Um, and also just a, a little bit of a comment on the Alliance before going into central protection. So, you know, when we were launching the Alliance exactly five years ago and, and Save the Children in the position of one of the initial co-leads, we had a, a glimmer of its potential, but you know, the increase in the range of members, the fact that 60% are national organizations the richness of the exchanges that we've seen from participants from over 130 countries this week. I mean, it just, it, 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 you know, it has spilled over into much more um, than we could have imagined. Um, and, and really the best of all now to be launching this strategy um, that kind of shows a clear path forward, you know, having drawn on all those discussions and all those um, desires of people to cover, you know, participation, accountability, um, so now we have a strategy that is punctuated by accountability, localization, integration, prevention, and seeks a way to prepare to tackle climate uh, crisis and climate justice. Um, to me, this also shows that this is an alliance whose time has come. And one of the reasons its time has come is that it can give reality to the centrality of protection. So the centrality of protection has been an obligation um, and a requirement for donors for over a decade, but as is being examined in the uh, IASC review, much more is needed to, to bring it to life and deliver it. Um, and what is that? You know, it's that it's that protection is at the heart of humanitarian action and its purpose, and it's not a poor cousin. It's at the heart of the family and central to its action. And as you know, William has just been so incredibly articulate and eloquent in, in, in phrasing it in so many good ways about you know, the import that the children are the, the majority and their agency is so important. So just in terms of looking at the centrality of protection, because I think um, you know, we, we have in the strategy the centrality of children and their protection, but we do need to, to interact with the formal um, centrality of protection um, uh, sort of uh, policies and obligations within the humanitarian sector to be able to have that dialogue and 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 uh, and, and make it work. So that I think you know there there are three aspects that I would sort of highlight. One is that protection is a responsibility of all. It's not siloed. It, uh, it must make up the center of sectors, clusters, refugee responses. Um, and here we can see, you know, and again, William's analogies were absolutely amazing. Um, but here we can see that the strategies pillar on integration, on multi-sector programming and integration, and some of the really rich discussions already held this week on that, 
uh, allows this, the alliance to really be able to show the way, you know, between practitioners, policymakers, uh, at showing how this can be done. What does it actually look like? Um, and then another aspect of centrality of protection, which I think is important to, to, to highlight, is that it is about standing up for international protection standards, international humanitarian law, you know, human rights law, refugee law, even international criminal law. And it involves calling out when we see that these are violated, such as in attacks on schools, or when children are turned away from shores when they're seeking asylum and, 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 and refuge. Um, and so there is that element of, of, of calling out and, and, and being able to actually be preventing violations by uh, addressing questions like impunity. So here we see the accountability pillar, which we have phrased as accountability to children, but it's, it, it, it also brings in the possibility of accountability um, for international uh, human, uh, humanitarian human rights um, standards. Um, and, uh, and, and as I said, this is, this is also related to prevention in that reducing impunity for violations is necessary to prevent those violations from occurring and reoccurring. And therefore we must use the mechanisms that we have um, within the humanitarian system and within the human rights system to, 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 to be calling on that kind of protection. Um, and, then, and then a third in terms of the practical is about bringing greater analysis and greater conflict sensitivity um, to, to all that we do so that we can anticipate um, and uh, uh, anticipate an impact on, for example, the dynamics of conflict or the protection impacts of famine and crisis, uh, climate crisis. So, um, at, at, uh, and we'll, we'll carry on the discussion and move on to other, other panelists, but I think those elements that we can see that actually our, our core functions in the Alliance are able to dialogue with those very well in terms of evidence, in terms of learning, um, in terms of um, uh, standards and 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 advocacy, um, and 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 those those kind of later discussions about how the core functions help deliver both the centrality of protection and the centrality of children and their protection is something that you know will will progress throughout this week and then into the, the coming years. So that was my comment. Thank, thank you, Alison. Um, uh, I want to just pause for a moment just to, to flag to everyone. So we've switched the poll now uh, and we're asking, what do you think? What does the centrality of children and their protection mean to you? Just so we're all still together on this. Um, I want to pick up from what you've both been saying and go to you, Tasha. Um, you know, William and Allison have identified a lot of different um, a lot of different ways that children and their protection needs and, and, and sort of different scenarios where we would need to put children at the center in order, uh, you know, to be accountable to them and for them in order to really uh, ensure that uh, all different kinds of, of contexts and humanitarian crises um, are fully responding to their needs, taking into consideration uh, their protection capacities. Um, what would it look like, uh, you know, if we when we put children at the center, um, if, if responses were designed that way, if we really uh, took these words to heart, took this goal to heart, and and worked towards um, humanitarian response, humanitarian action that really started from children at the heart of it. Thank you, Leah. Um, and I want to start by really congratulating the Alliance for the strategy that you've just presented. And thank you, Lael, for shepherding this through and your intellectual leadership on all of this. I am stunned again at how great the strategy is. And I'm pleased to be with such advocates and champions of the Alliance on this panel um, and inspired by their commitment and their vision for the future um, and share that vision with them. Um, and so that leads me right into what a powerful call to action this idea of putting children at the center is. Um, and I think the voices we've just heard really speak to that, but I would say this entire week speaks to that. Um, and when we talk about putting children at the center, um, 
you know, I think that both William and Allison start to get at what that means and what that looks like. Um, and concrete terms, we're talking about children's participation in all aspects of the way that we do humanitarian action, in the assessment, in the design, in the monitoring, in the metrics. And all too often children are present in description of a humanitarian situation, but not central in the action that addresses that humanitarian crisis. Um, lengthy descriptions about what has happened to children, but not their agency and not the actions then that will address those, those issues. And so two things I wanna highlight about that. One is the holistic understanding of a child. And I think William was getting at that and Allison in terms of multi-sectoral is that when we look at a child, it is not only those food security needs, it's all of those other needs as well. And so a holistic picture of a child. And that's what William was saying about what's happening above and under the table, but also the diversity of children. When we talk about children, it's not just one 10-year-old boy who is all children. It's a three-year-old girl, it's a 17-year-old girl, it's an 11-year-old girl, and they all have different um, aspects to their vulnerability and their ability, um, disability and capacity. So really the diversity is, is critical here. And so what all of that means is children's participation and participation that results in decision-making. And maybe this is what answers your question, Lyle, about what this looks like. It's not participation only to report back on participation. It changes the decisions about the work. And when that happens, it's not possible to only work that so children survive. Then we are working for children's best interests. You know, and William had mentioned that idea of best interests. And that's what brings us to putting the protection of children at the center of our work as well. So centrality of children and the centrality of their protection. And so what does that mean? What does that look like? Um, and I think we've already hinted at that, that child protection is systematically in all risk analysis, not only child protection risk analysis. Um, the monitoring of protection and rights violations include monitoring of child rights violations. Um, it's part of the protection strategies, the response plans, not just the needs assessment. It's part of the refugee response plans. All of the action to address a humanitarian crisis then puts children and their protection at the center. And that also means that we look to and hold accountable the leadership across humanitarian action to do that as well and to speak that and act it. And I think that just for all of this discussion and when I think back about how transformative um, the past couple of years have been with the global pandemic, it's a story of huge setbacks for children and their rights and their development, huge setbacks. And the toll that it has taken on children's lives and their well-being, on their minds, is so massive that the obligation now to learn the lessons from that for the centrality of children and the centrality of their protection cannot be ignored. Um, and this is where the strategy is taking us. So two things here, one is about recognizing that the child protection services are essential. We all advocated for that and we got there, but it took time. So let us make sure that that fight for social services as life-saving for child protection services is recognized from the outset, that there's no longer a need to advocate and fight for that. That is taken as the way that we work. Um, and Linked to that then is the idea of early warning and that we invest in these protection services from the outset because they're fundamental to the concept of prevention, that we invest on a no regrets basis. That will be the transformation of what this strategy entails. And I agree with the panelists, the Alliance is perfectly positioned to take that forward. Thank you, Lael. Thank you, Tasha. Um, and uh, I thank, thank the three of you. I mean, we're not done yet, but you're complimenting each other so nicely and around the areas that we um, that we talk about at the strategy and that everyone here will will really spend the next few hours talking about um, you know especially around you know accountability to children for children and the obligations that we have the working across sectors piece um, I want to come to um, actually William or Allison I'm going to open this up either way uh, for you I mean Tasha has laid the groundwork and you've both touched on this in your first answers um, what would it look like? What would be different if we were to put children at the center of these responses and 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 really push on this? Um, you know, William, you kind of also said that we don't need to fight, and I think we're so used to fighting in child protection for our space, for 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 the needs for children, for their uh, recognition as not just a vulnerable group, but a, a group that has capacity and that contribute. So, what does it look like, and what is different when we when we when that is the starting point, and everyone is there with us? I can come in quickly 
um, just because I wanted to f follow up the um, the analogy of, 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 well, first of all, just that the clarion call of the strategy is just so exciting. And that's, um, uh, you know, drawing attention to to children to the humanitarian purpose, but as active agents of humanitarian response and part of their communities and also that the communities must be much more strongly engaged. Um, and, uh, and with this particular rights focus. So just following up, I've got a slightly different analogy about a table from, from, from William, but to me, it's about bringing children to the adults table or maybe adults to the children's table. It's bringing the voices of children to situation analysis and for example, if we take a particular example, you know, there's a whole discussion again, kind of increased through the COVID about um, gender-based violence funding and how, you know, how this is really essential and must be supported. But we want to make sure, we want to have adolescent girls at that table to make sure that that funding is directed towards strengthening age appropriate GBV services for adolescent girls. We know there's that huge space. We know the need for girl friendly spaces and that we involve child and girl led organizations in developing that offer. So, so again, it's sort of, you know, following up from Tasha, but it's about the engagement. It's about the act, you know, active engagement of children as, as an actor in the process. And I'll hand on back to William on that. Yes, thanks. Uh, thanks, Alison. Um, I think the, the, the call for leading with comfort for child protection actors, it's, uh, it's not just a rhetoric. I did mention the, the sheer numbers and the fact, the, the mathematical fact that most of our humanitarian aid goes to children in some way or another uh, is important. And I think the first change on the ground that we want to see is that does the rest of the humanitarian sector know that most of their aid is going to children and are they calculating how to do it in a way where the child best interest is, is in mind. And I think this recognition is, is, is becoming there in a more and more appropriate way and your drive to, to explain that fact and make everyone realize what we are all doing uh, is important. And then this analytical click of who are we accountable for and what's in best, their best interest needs to become more and more uh, democratized and spread and uh, all the sector aware of it. But the second area is if I look in, in, in our protection cluster, I mean, we have two spe specialized areas of protection that are totally ahead of everything else. It's gender-based violence and child protection. So I'll, our child protection area of responsibility, if you, if you have to think from a humanitarian professionalizing perspective, it's, it's fantastic. I mean, you've got strong policies. You have experts for years who have been working in this area. You have standards. You have projects and programs and interventions that are improving all the time. Uh, you have an AOR that is so present in the field and active and pushing. Uh, and, and I see that and I look at the other areas of protection. And I was like, I want everyone else to come to become like that. But that feeling, we need to translate it more and more. We need to, to make sure we, uh, we recognize how expert uh, this group of actors is. And uh, when children and their protection is central in the field, the change that I want to see is a behavioral one where uh, we don't ask for more resources for protection because we have gaps of resources. We ask for more resources because it's the smartest possible investment to have. And that mind shift is a bit like a, a, an opposition uh, uh, group who has become the government. <laughs> and you, you need this mentality of shift that here we are, we are one of the best responders. And if you want to be successful, come and work with us kind of mentality. And I hope this strategy would allow for this. The, th the third and last point I would like to see more of is, um, is visibility for children. 
children being half of the population doesn't mean they're visible all the time. I was in Congo uh, two weeks ago and one lady, and I will, I will read what she said to me because I noted it down. She said to me that the, the, there is this crushing feeling of being alone, that no one knows, that no one cares. No one is willing to go one extra mile to save us. Don't I matter? This feeling of being insignificant is the hardest part of surviving an attack, a crime, a conflict. This invisible loneliness for our children when they're recruited is the machete that chops off dignity. It is the mind that explodes peace. It's the bullet that kills hope. And I was silent when she said that. And in a country where there are 10 million children in very clear need of protection, the first thing that comes to your face when I'm singing all my we're dominant and there is a lot of kids is a lady that helps kids reintegrate in society and telling me my biggest problem is invisibility. We have to stand and recognize that. And that takes a lot of storytelling, uh, endless advocacy uh, and circling all the way to what Tasha and Alison said, bringing kids to the table because having that story told by kids and that case made by children and these priorities omnipresent by their presence is crucial to crush this invisibility and allow this concept of, of being present as protection actors, telling the story and being protective by our presence and by this direct engagement on the front lines. Back to you. Thank you, William. Um, and I recognize that quote from your update this month, which I will plug shortly because it's the updates that the GPC does, I find to be really, really excellent. Um, and I'm gonna pull from that because I think as child protection practitioners in particular, a lot of us have heard the similar things from children that they feel invisible, that they don't feel um, like, you know, that they're, they're spoken to, that they're provided for, and that they're not given a chance to, to speak for themselves, to be at that table. Um, Allison, uh, as we look to wrap up this conversation, what do you think the Alliance can do? We have launching this new strategy shortly. Um, what can the Alliance do to help, to help push on these areas, to really help um, uh, support and, and ensure that uh, children are not feeling invisible, their families are not feeling invisible? their communities are not feeling invisible. Well, I think, I mean, the Alliance right now, that's the people that are around this table that are in, you know, in this discussion. And I think the, the and we're gonna have, you know, following discussions on the detail, but I think basically that just to keep engaging and exchanging, because from the exchanges that we already had, we have this amazing experience. We have um, the practitioners and we have a sort of commitment to these, these pillars, accountability to children, localization, integration, and prevention, which, you know, that's been drawn out of all this work together. And therefore, the, uh, you know, what the Alliance can do is just go deeper into this strategy and help deliver it, but through the participation of all, you know, so that what it makes sense to, you know, uh, 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 you know, in, in different countries, um, in other headquarters of other agencies, you know, making sure that we're able to really give reality to the centrality of protection and the centrality of children protection. And I think the other way that we, you know, work that through is through um, the way that the core functions of the Alliance, um, again, deeply linked to their experience are able to take this forward sort of a standard bearer. So we've got, you know, the functions and the working groups on standards, on evidence, on learning and on advocacy and convening. And, and, and therefore just th that everybody commits to take this forward because it really, I think it's a very inspiring vision. And as William said, we do have um, the force now to be able to kind of take that, take this up and show the way to others. I would say that on child protection financing, 
um, there is still a big way to go. And, and this is one of the um, you know, um, objectives of within the advocacy group that we have to move forward on this. We can't have the CPOR with such low funding in so many responses. Um, and therefore, you know, we must fight for um, you know, fully funded responses, but at least that the percentage is on a par with other, um, other clusters. Um, but, uh, and, and for that, we've been looking deeply into how can, we, how can we address some of the concerns of donors about integration, about needs assessment, about localization. So again, the, 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 the Alliance is such a dynamic space for, 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 for seeking solutions. And we're, you know, we're seeing it, I mean, if you just look at the production uh, of, of, of um, guidance and uh, uh, all the different things that we're able to produce together in the Alliance, bringing together the different agencies and, and the way that the trust that's been built within the Alliance so that people are prepared to offer and share. And that's, that's what I think is so, um, you know, I think we want to celebrate and also just motivate people to take that forward. Thank you, Alison. And I think I'm glad you brought up the point on funding, which is very much in the strategy. Um, and I think a lot of us feel that in securing um, better and full, I think we can push it to full funding for child protection. You know, we not only enable uh, protection and well-being for children and their families and communities, but so many of the other sectoral outcomes, so many of the ultimate goals of what we're trying to achieve collectively can actually be reached and can actually be supported through this core funding um, in a way that some, you know, that um, that isn't always very clear to everyone. Tasha, I'm going to come to you to conclude this session um, or this, this discussion, uh, which I feel like many of us could just sit here forever really talking about these things. Um, recognizing uh, that that the audience has not seen the strategy yet. <laughs> and so <laughs> we're referencing, you know, priorities, goals, the, the clarion call, which I'm sure everyone is like, the what? We'll get there. Don't worry, folks. <laughs> but, um, you know, when we, when we talk fundamentally, and this is what the call is to place children uh, and their protection at the center of humanitarian action, what role can the, what can the Alliance do in basically achieving and in progressing? I think achieving is a big word. Uh, how can we progress towards this in the coming years? Thanks, Lael. And I'd like to start just because it is the fifth anniversary to appreciate Alison in particular and save the children um, who were co-leads, as she mentioned, of the Alliance. And I had the pleasure of working along SAVE in that way. Earlier this week, I mentioned Plan International, the current co-lead and World Vision upcoming. But I want to pay tribute to Alison in particular, who continues to, as an individual and a force of nature, be that leading voice in the Alliance. So thank you, Alison, for that. And I think we heard that voice again today. Um, I'll, I'll speak to perhaps just two areas where I see the Alliance taking forward the strategy um, and where there are areas of new and opening leadership for the Alliance. And I really think that that is made possible by everything that's been said today and what you just highlighted kind of, or Alison just highlighted this robust technical guidance, this foundation that has taken, you know, on all practitioners, we can now move forward. And there are two areas in particular I'd like to highlight highlight um, within the first strategic priority, which, as you said, soon everyone will see. Um, and that's around the accountability to children, because this links so closely to the participation piece and the voice that I was talking about. Um, and there's a commitment there, a priority to strengthen accountability to children through their meaningful engagement. Um, and what I want to highlight is that there's a lot of work happening around accountability to affected populations. The space for the Alliance's leadership on defining that for children and making that space for children, making them visible, right? And no longer invisible to pick up what William was saying is critical. And I think the Alliance is able to do that um, and transform the way that AAP, Accountability to Affected Populations works in order to be responsive to um, children. So that's a key one for taking forward, I think. Um, and the second one is, again, related to this idea of accountability, um, and this has come up earlier, is about advocacy. And as much as we have invested in the, the foundations of and responding to um, humanitarian crises and, and the impact on, on the protection of children, I think that we can continue and do more as an advocate um, 
raising up the voices of children and their caregivers, um, and also speaking out as the Alliance. Um, and I want to compliment the, the description, um, the, the, the voice um, from Congo that William gave with some numbers to mention that last year, there were over 26,000 grave violations against children. And those are only the ones that were documented, meaning visible, and so many more were invisible, right? And that's about 72 violations per day that were counted. Right. And so I do think that in the past, you know, um, quarter century since this another clarion call of Gracia Michelle on the, the impacts of on children in war, there's real significant progress that's been made on accountability measures. And yet these violations continue visible and invisible. And so I do believe that the strategy and the focus on this will lead the alliance to embrace a greater advocacy voice and role. It's a voice that we have because it's everyone's voice. All of the members of the network of the Alliance, we have that voice and we can use it more to advocate for children and accountability to children for violations and for the way in which humanitarian action addresses them, their needs and strengthens their dignity. So thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Tasha. Thank you, Allison. Thank you, William. Um, like I said, I think we could have all just sat here and listen, looking in the chat, we could have just kept this conversation going um, for quite some time. Uh, and we will in different ways. Um, so thank you for, for getting us started. Um, we have a couple minutes before the break, everyone. So I'm just going to give you a lay of what's coming up for the rest of these sessions. Um, we have four rooms. Each room has a is themed per a priority in the strategy. So for the next, you know, we have a 10 minute break coming up after that, a 65 minute session, and then another 10 minute break, and then another 65 minute session. So hang with me. Uh, one room is going to focus on our accountability priority. Um, and it will talk about accountability and on participation. So you'll see in that first session, um, it's going to be the team from the ISC guidelines that came out earlier this year, uh, late last year, uh, on working for and with young people. Um, they have a really, really great interactive session lined up. So that's going to be the first conversation happening in accountability. At the same time, so these are all in parallel. I'm so sorry, but you're going to have to pick a conversation to join. We are recording them. You can catch the others later. I'm in the same boat. I want to be in all of them. At the same time in the localization room, uh, we are going to unpack objective two, which you haven't seen yet, but objective two is about how the Alliance can advocate and help facilitate more direct and flexible funding for local and national organizations. We're gonna have a brainstorm on that. Uh, at the same time in, in the next room on the multi-sector priority. Uh, there's going to be two parallel conversations happening there. One with child protection and education, um, bringing together the cluster, the, sorry, the global education cluster, the AOR, um, the Alliance and the INEE. Another one led by our wonderful CPMS working group colleagues on how uh, the work that they do across sectors and this strategic priority complement each other so well. Uh, and then in our fourth room, we will have um, prevention, and they are going to take some of these discussions that have been happening throughout the week and really operationalize them and look at strategies and approaches. So all of these conversations are um, not, they're, they're different from the panels that you've participated in so far. These are set up as much more brainstorm work sessions. Um, we are using this as a consultation. So we started last year with a consultation on what should go in the strategy. This year we're starting, uh, we're wrapping up with a consultation on how should we implement it? We are looking for your feedback and input and ideas on, uh, you know, for the next five years, what would you like to see the Alliance do in these areas? So that's the first part. In the second part, so 10 minutes breaks, same priorities, different conversations. So in accountability, there will be a split conversation, one on accountability for children affected by armed conflict, which really connects to what Allison and Tasha were just saying. A second one on uh, child-friendly feedback mechanisms and how to strengthen those. Uh, that's a shortened title. Um, in the localization room, a conversation around leadership decision-making and transforming how the sector works. That is the goal for the localization priority. Um, in the multi-sector room, a conversation with the three protection sectors, child protection, GBV, and protection on how we can strengthen collaboration across them. Uh, there was a really big uh, uh, ask for this out of the consultations we did during the strategy. And I'm running out of time. And lastly, um, evidence and learning and knowledge generation in the prevention room. It's a lot. We're asking you to pick one conversation in the first part, one in the second part. There is a poll in the chat box. 
if you can give us a heads up of where you're going, that will help immensely. There is also a Google form in the chat box if you want more information on any of the priorities. If you want to be involved going forward, sign up and that's going to be shared in all the sessions. So one minute over, I apologize. Thank you so much to our panelists. Thank you all for joining and we will see you in now nine minutes in one of these rooms. <laughs>